Blog Talk Radio. Yo, 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 what's up, what's up, world? It's badass stunning like I usually do. And you better turn it up, bust some speakers out, because we off the motherfucking cup. You dig how we do it? Dog Pound Gangsters 2000 and beyond. Yo, yo, check this out. This is your girl, Cola Boat, and I'm chilling with my boys right here on Off the Cuff Radio. Because we off the cuff right now. You big? That. Yeah. Oh, oh. What's up? What's up? It's your boy, Lil Yap, with UNLV. Bragging up from the river. Cooling with my homies and my family at Off the Cuff Radio. Y'all be sure to tune in on Fridays and get the latest scoop and find out what's happening. You avoid me? Tiffany Levine. And this Queen Crazy, your girl, says a bartender. And we're from Sex on the Rocks Podcast. All right, you're now tuning in to Off the Cuff Radio. Yeah, because they keep representing that world hip hop. Well, much love. All right. Yeah, this is Princess Daisy giving a shout out to King Eric and Off the Cuff Radio. Keep doing your thing, puppy. Mm. Hey y'all, this is Stacey Lachey, giving a shout out to King Eric and Off the Cuff Radio. We're shaking, y'all. This is the grand. One half of Lost Cause and one third of that drive time thing. Sending my love to the homies over at Off The Cuff Radio. Tune in every Friday night for some real deal hip-hop conversation. These dudes are the connoisseurs of this thing. You already know what it is. BX Stand Up, Hud City, we're shaking. Peace. Yo, this is No Fresh to Dine. And y'all tuned in to the most raw, uncut show on radio. The guillotine team. Off The Cuff. And yo, Eric Sandman. Off The Cuff. Go to the HBC, you and now I'm here. So 
talking FCS, we talking Howard D, we talking Morgan State, we talking PDU, we talking Morehouse, we talking Morris Brown, we talking XUND, we the stepping two, we talking Mississippi Valley and El Cone, we talking Tuskegee and Savannah State, we talking Clark and Atlanta, A and M and Alabama, Mississippi Central, Winston Salem State, make the ground shake. Oh my life, I want it to go. Sponsored by Jesse's Boutiques, sponsored by Corva Financial, and Buddy Boy Entertainment. So before I bring my man T Match with the facts on, I just want to let y'all know that I appreciate everybody that take time to make this 300 episode plus happen. We can't do it without y'all, so we go keep it pushing for the culture. So I got my man T Max with the facts on the line. What to do, man? It's Friday night. OTC up in the place to be. And once again, we have dedicated ourselves the guillotine, L.R. the Sandman, King Eric, Ladies and Chilla, Soilla, and myself to giving you the most uncut, the most in your face, and the most entertaining journalism on this side of the internet radio, sponsored by Blog Talk, for us, you know, being able to be on. So, King, um, Look, we, we got a legend on our show tonight, man. It's only right that you hip our audience to who he is. Most definitely. Now, before I do that, I want to say that the track that we just played is courtesy of our guest of the night. This man here has All laid right. the pavement <laughs> to one of the biggest dynasties that ever ushered in hip-hop culture. This guy here was a part of that blueprint that opened up a lot of doors for the South, the West Coast, and a part of that juggernaut in the late 90s. So, without further ado, we about to put on one of the hardest working men in the New Orleans rap scene, a legend on his own right, Mr. Servone, y'all. What's happening, man? What's going on with y'all, man? How are y'all today, man? What's going on, man? Great to have you with us, man. We're humbled and honored to have you on. You know, uh, I'm honored. I mean, I'm honored, man. Definitely, definitely. Fair. I'm very honored, man. Yeah. Very humbled, man. You know what I'm saying? Thank you guys much, man. I mean, you're very welcome. I mean, uh, like King said, you know, you were part of one of the undoubtedly. Uh, there were, you know, during that 90s era, you know, going into the 2000s, No Limit Records, and, you know, probably you could say there was the big three as the hip-hop culture progressed in terms of really becoming more of a business. Of course, you know, you had Def Jam, you know, shout out to Uncle Russ, you know, who really, you know, really kicked it off for definitely. the, you, definitely. Know, definitely. you know, definitely uh, for the 80s. And, of course, you know, as it progressed, you know, that would be bad boy. You know, we would be remiss without Definitely. sending our love and condolences, you know, to Andre Harrell, who brought Puffy in, you oh, know, who yeah, would also yeah, play man, Bad Boy Entertainment. That was a rough one that and, year. Yeah, it was. You know, and then, of course, Death Row, you know, shout out to Suge Knight. And then, of course, you know, some Definitely. guy from, Definitely. you know, you know, New Orleans, Louisiana, Third Ward, Calio, 
had a little time in Bay Area, Richmond, California. You by the name yes, of Master sir. P. You know, yeah. and, uh, you were part of that. Yeah, I was the boss, man. Yeah, man. Yeah, so, I mean, uh, I guess we're going to get right to it, man. Tell us a little bit about yourself, you know, your your life, you know, how you got into hip-hop, you know, or how you got, I mean, uh, like, look, we got two hours, man. The floor is yours. Uh, man, um, music was always, you know what I'm saying, uh, uh, a big part of my life. You know, being from New Orleans, New Orleans is a music city, it's a music town, it's a historic music town, you know, from, from jazz on, to R&B. Yeah. I mean, you name it. I mean, gospel, you know what I'm saying, rap music, bounce, you know, which is prevalent, you know what I'm saying, that's that's really going through the industry big time right now, you know, with a lot Mm -hmm. of artists, you know, using that style. And so for me, you know, you know, coming up, you know, I had, you know, posters on my wall, man, of of the Snoops and all that stuff and the treasures from Naughty by Nature, Ice Cube, Skullface. You know, LL Cool J, you know, these are people that one day I said I wanted them to know my name. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I wanted to represent. So, you know, and I was, basketball was my first love. You know what I'm saying? Not like some of these rappers that say they play ball, they be on MTV and all that. Now I played it for real. All of them know living guys for real. You know what I'm saying? So, and I ended up in, you know, Virginia in the military, you know, due to certain circumstances, you know, being young and immature, things happen. And so, you know, mm-hmm. change the scenery. And I ended up at Virginia, which means, you know, I was meeting guys from all sorts of places. And one of the things that kind of changed me, a friend of mine from, from Louisville, Corey Dutton, decided he was going to rap and he wanted to go in the studio. So, you know, I would rap, but I wouldn't really tell nobody because I was doing it in high school with my friend Frank Jackson, like before the dances and stuff, high school dances, think it's, hopefully we get the mic or whatever. You know, and so, you know, and back then in New Orleans, you had the great Gregory D and the Tim Smooths. Well, when we, he wasn't Manny, you know, he was Manny Fresh then, but he was he was part of a group, you know, the Ninja Crew with, with Gregory D and Lil Daddy and all them. You know, so, uh, you know, those are the people we looked up to. So when I get to Virginia, you know, it's like I'm freestyling, and I remember some guys from New York was like, yo, you tight where you from and I said New Orleans and they just turned it back on me and for me it was like the most greatest disrespect it was like it was like well y'all was good for murder and Mardi Gras so my thing right then and there that day that they didn't know was I, I want I set out to make to say you know I gotta be a part of making New Orleans be respected you know what I'm saying music wise so I had this vendetta in me you know what I'm saying so you know I would go up to New York with friends and I would study, I would pay attention, you know, you'd catch dudes rapping, you know what I'm saying? And I was on the East Coast so long when I just, when, you know, I was in the military and I ended up getting in trouble and getting put out of the military, you know, for drug distribution, you know, which is, you know, immature, dumb mistake. You didn't get paid that much in the military and I wanted to help, you know, home better, you know, and things like that. So I ended up, you know, after some brief time somewhere, you know, I ended up home. And I wanted to follow my rap career. And one of the things when I got home, New Orleans was such a bounce oriented, you know, and the the, the the rappers they did have, the great Tim Smooth, you know, was doing things, 3-9 Posse from New Orleans, you know, giving us some history. And you had on my from my block, on my corner, the great UNLV. You know what I'm saying? Oh, and, um, niggas living by yeah. The, yeah. Yeah, man, they was before me, man. That was that was my, and they were younger than me, man, little knuckleheads. But you know, they were they were doing it. And then one of my best friends from school and seeing them in the military was mystical. And so, mm-hmm. you know, for me, it was kind of a hard situation because they had their little riff going, which I didn't I didn't know when I came home. So now I'm around them, and then you know, and, and around UNLV, I would see them, and yeah, DJ Jimmy and. Back then, it was Juvenile was younger, and he was really doing bounce. You know, you had the Soldier Slim, you had everybody. But for me, I was different. And uh, my my cousin's husband was a big-time manager, and I rapped for him. And by me having a, you know, almost an East Coast style and and tongue-twisting, you know, he was like, it'll never happen. But, you know, I kind of was like, I'm a hustler. I'm going to get where I got to go. 
and I end up going to HBCU, you know, uh, Southern University in New Orleans. And, you know, I ended up meeting one of my idols, which was 3-9 Posse, MC Dart. And he brought me to a basement. And KLC was in there, which was like an idol of mine also. And he asked me to rap for him, you know. And so when I rapped for him, he would turn around. He'd just look and say, you all right, and turn back around. He was like, but you don't know how to rap. And I'm like looking at him like, you know what? I'm sitting here with, with money in my pocket, jewelry on and all that. I learned a lesson that day. All that I had on money and I'm like, you know, and he's sitting in this little small basement, you know, and it was like, that don't matter. You know what I'm saying? It's about the art. It's about the music. And he was like, come back here tomorrow about four or five o'clock if you can. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and we definitely gonna, we, we definitely gonna make it happen. And so I started out with him, you know what I'm saying? And we started out with everybody. He had Soldier Slim, he had Juvie come through there, the Miz, the Fiends, you know, Mac was from around there. He was down there. We had EXD. We had so many different artists, but Soldier was that artist, you know what I'm saying? And so at that time, and, and, you know, we, you know, was Slim, he ended up getting shot and then ended up going to jail. And everybody was like fading away. Mystical was with us. He he moved on to another label that he felt big boy, which was a prevalent label back then, that was uh you know was able to put him where he felt he needed to go. So it just left me in KL, and we just fought hard and kept fighting. You know what I'm saying? And and I always tell a story. We used to we survived off honey buns and ruffles, man, and little small jungle juices. That's you know we after taking care of our kids, our family, and. We never had much, so and I was still out there hustling. And the thing for him was, if you're going to do this, you got to get out of the streets. I can't have that around me. So I'm like, you know, I wanted it that bad. And so long story short, man, we end up in Atlanta to Jack the Rappers, and we ain't had no passes. And, you know, me being me, I'm like, somebody got to give us some passes, you know what I'm saying? Which is still now, I look at it young and dumb and immature. Got us some passes, got in there. And a fight broke out between Death Row and Luke Skywalker Records. And right at that oh, wow. moment, yeah, yeah, we was right there. And and that's when they had their beef going on. And, and I look up and there, I see, you know, P and I see, you know, see Murder. Well, he was Corey to me. I'm, my name Corey, his name Corey. He, you know, I knew them from going, you know, from, you know, growing up. And he was like, man, what you mm-hmm. doing out here in the middle of a fight? You know, they got... <laughs> gun out and everything. You all right? You all right? You know, him and P got their guns on their side. Like, you all right? I'm like, yeah, what's going on? And he was like, well, man, we out here trying to get signed. We really was looking for Jermaine Dupree. We wanted to bring KLC sound, that sound that y'all got to love. You know, the, the long, you know, the bout it song and everything, man, the, the track and everything. We wanted we wanted to sign, mess, deal with Jermaine Dupree. You know, that's who we was really there to meet. And, you know, trying to get with. And so we ended up going to eat with him, and he went to telling us about his label. And, you know, he was always like somebody I looked up to, you know, followed him everywhere, playing ball. Me and C. Murder would follow him everywhere. And so, you know, he said, come to, you know, he hit me up, and he was like, man, why don't you come to, y'all come to Cali? I'm putting together this album. And, you know, he was like, why don't you come? And at first, I was, you know, he was like, you know, okay, we're going to see what we're going to do, man. I mean, I'm. He was like, I'll give you 2500 for a song. Now, we talking back then, 2500 for a song. Yeah. You know, and nobody yeah. really really knew knew us, you know what I'm saying, what knew me. You know, I was like, man, let's do it. And so, you know, he was like, what, what we got to lose? The plane ticket free. We'll see what he's talking about. And me, KL, and, and we end up end up seeing Mia X on the plane, and which I was like a big fan, you know. So us three went up there for... For, for the weekend and as soon as we touched down man he uh, 20 we hadn't even did the song gave us our money he had tanks already w- ready for us jackets and everything <laughs> and oh, so shit. he took us around okay. first song i ever did was called handle your business and it was a commercial and it was done by the multi-platinum producer two show producer uh l eaton and you know, and the thing about it was, you know, P knew I wanted to get back in school and play ball, and he was going to hook that up and, and things like that. But, you know, thankful to E-40, who heard the song and was like, yo, whoever that is, be nice. And P said, that's him. 
And I'm still in awe when I see he fought it, and he was like, yeah, see, you got to, you need, you know, fuck with him. And so I was like, okay, maybe it's starting to happen. And so, you know, we did a few things, and then we came home, and I started getting back into the streets, and I kind of got into a serious situation. You know, that was some life and death stuff, you know, where people was coming to my mom's house. And so I called P, and P was like, you know, just make it till the morning, and you make it till the morning, I got you. You know what I'm saying? And so for me, I just had to kind of duck and dodge and make it show my mom how so straight and, you know, and do what I got to do. And I made it to the airport. And, you know, from then on, the rest is history. You know, and I ended up putting out my first album, which people consider classic life insurance. That was number five on Billboard, which is now platinum. Mm-hmm. Um, and then my second album went number one. You know, which had the late great big pun on it. You know, with song and why they you know. And why they and know. Good. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. that album yeah. was number one on Billboard. Is now since platinum. You know. Um. You know, we did a lot, man. Uh, you know, music wise, I played a big part, which was helpful to me in the movie I'm about it. I was I always say I was one of the first bad guys in a rap movie. You know what I'm saying? And so, <laughs> you know, that helped a lot, man. You know what I'm saying? So. You know, and it, you know, we 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 did a lot, man. I appeared on over forty-five golden platinum albums. Um, appeared in five movies. Uh, wow. You know what I mean? And you know what I mean? And it, it's it's been you know a career, of course, that that I'm I'm truly proud about. You know what I'm saying? That that I've done. You know what I mean? And I've I've dealt with several. You know, I was actually responsible for introducing. You know what I'm saying? Different people. You know, to executive, you know, I don't, you know, because you sign exclusive agreements, but just know, like, you know, when you, you know, whether it's Bootsy or Webby and things like that, you know what I'm saying? You know, I knew their label owners and stuff like that, Mel and Turk, good guys and stuff, and, and you know, talking with, with execs and things like that and other, other people I connected throughout the industry and things like that, man. So, you know, I, I've done my thing in front and mostly behind the scenes. You know what I mean? That a lot of people don't know, especially in my city of New Orleans, I think, because I didn't come up in their era with the bounce. I wasn't rapping and everything, doing the bounce thing. So sometimes in New Orleans, and it's funny to say, when they say legend, in New Orleans people say legend, they they don't say my name, but around the world my name is said. You know what I'm saying? And half of them have no idea the things that I did to open doors, you know, you know, for artists to do certain things and what my contribution was to No Limit, you know, which opened the doors for a lot of situations in New Orleans, like a lot of artists that ended up on No Limit, you know what I'm saying? I mean, that was like courtesy of things that me and KL dreamed of, you know, because me and KLC, we had a roster, a huge roster, and if you look at the roster we had, that same roster ended up on No Limit once we started making it and doing things, you know what I'm saying? I mean, so we had a dream, a sound, a style that we wanted, you know what I'm saying? And once we got it to the to the greatest hustler in the game, and he, he figured out what he needed to figure out and made his adjustments and change, and the rest is history. You know, and so that's, that's basically who I am from Uptown. Man, uh, your town, New Orleans, man, Third Ward, right same corner from UNLV. You know what I'm saying? So that's, that's, that's who Serve On is, man. Okay. Now, you know now, I gotta sir, get into you... that, man. I gotta get into because I was actually watching this the other day. The I'm about it movie, man. You had the back <laughs> scene, man. That was one of the craziest <laughs> scenes I ever seen, man. How did y'all even get that done? Like shooting that? Y'all put like a? Did he just like stand still and, and while you was hitting him, or you just put a dummy up there? No, um, nah, man. What it was was the craziest part. You know what I'm saying? Like, about all of it was, um, the way they did it was, man, and I got, I could give out the secret now, man. It was actually a watermelon. And, you know, it took the, the, the red dye with corn syrup or whatever or not, and I was actually beating a watermelon. That's why it looked like guts popping up everywhere and things like that, man. You know, and the funny thing about this, right, I was such an athlete. I didn't drink or smoke at that time, like smoke weed or whatever, right? And so when we were doing the scene, if you notice the scene, you know, we smoking, right? And so 
Yeah. The, our director, our director, who was once our basketball coach, you know, Moon Jones, Kenneth Jones, Moon he Jones. saved a lot yeah. of our lives. Yeah, he saved a lot of our lives growing up. People don't know he's one of the greatest historic AAU coaches ever. And he was my grammar school basketball coach, you know, and one of P's coaches too. And so he was the director, you know, and, and uh, along with P writing the movie and stuff like that. And so what they did was they gave us weed, right? And, man, I don't smoke. So every time you're smoking it, if they do a scene, they give you another one that starts from the beginning. So you got to imagine somebody that never smoked weed. Maybe I smoked weed, I could say, once when I was 15. And, you know, I got in trouble for it. Up until then, I was an athlete. I just didn't do that. So now I'm high. And, and it was funny, within the script, he called me stupid. And to me... It's three S's that I don't play with in my life. And, and it, I mean, it pissed me off. You don't call me stupid. Don't attempt to slap me and don't ever spit on me. The three S's. I feel like that's the worst you can, disrespectful way you could talk to any man or deal with any man. Right. And so in the script, right. he called me stupid. So, <laughs> so I really, I was high and I really was pissed off. So when you saw me beating it, it was like, like I was pissed off. I didn't, I don't like that word. And so then I was high, so you know what I mean? And so once they moved the watermelon, they put Twin back there and then, you know, put the the blood, fake blood on him. You know what I'm saying? But the the words were not even in the script. Everything you saw once I saw beating him, that was that was just my mind and me talking. That was that. I knew you was pissed off because yeah. you ran, you was going to run back and hit him again and you didn't even stop. <laughs> yeah. Now. yeah. I was cause oh, I was that's an ad lib right there. <laughs> yeah, cause twin, cause the twins, man, they're my guys, man. It came is so so through. He knew he knew it drove, cause he was like, I said, man, I don't like, and, and I I shouldn't have said anything to him, but then I'm glad I did because it came out. I was like, man, you gotta call me stupid, bro. I'm not feeling that word, and I kept trying to get him to change it, and he was like, man, tell him shoot a scene, and so it was like. He, if you look at him, he was like, man, you're just stupid. And he doubled up. You're just a stupid motherfucker. And, and he laughed because he knew I was getting pissed off, for, like for real. And so, yeah, it just went to another level, man. You know, and, and you know, sir, um, because I want to backtrack but then come back to it at the same time because this is around the time he mm-hmm. was really, really, you know what I'm saying, really began to make the moves because when Bout It came out, you know, the tank was already like rolling. So when we, mm-hmm. you know, look for all of our for all of our viewers out for all of our well, I said viewers, the listeners, y'all get it. But for all of our listeners out there, you got to remember during this time in the nineties, this is when you know like social media wasn't was it wasn't was what it is today. You know, primarily no. you were reading rap pages, Source magazine. Double XL, which were coming ninety seven. So all of this stuff was running through the magazine. You know, yeah. so uh, when we seen the ads for I'm about it, we were like, oh, shit, he's doing a movie? You know, and, uh, yeah. I was like, the and he was thing. determined, but, man. He was, de- he was determined, bro, you know, and his thing was, you know, anything you felt he could not do or a black man should not do with the music and entertainment, TV, he was going to do it. You know, no matter, he, he he's somebody that, man, I always say he has the memory of a cornerback. Deion Sanders once said the best cornerbacks are the ones that have a lost memory. They don't, even if you score the touchdown on them, they, they forget. And they lock you down the rest of the time. And he's the type of person, okay, you laugh at me, I, so what? Laugh. That make him go harder. Like, okay, you're paying attention. And, you know, the funny thing about it, what people don't know, the bout it child so might not have been the bout it that was going to be. Because actually we had mm-hmm. shot a whole bunch and when we got out to Mississippi for the scenes out there in the, uh, on, on the beach, the the original assistant director, who was you know, well, a camera guy, he uh, had a female. I guess he met and came to the room, came to the room, and she took a. It's funny. There's some crazy shit. She took the bag that had all the filming we had shot so far, right? So mm-hmm. you got to really sit down and think that she stole something and probably saw it and just threw it away and then know she threw away $50 million, $50 million, the film that made 50 to almost $75 million, right? 
she threw that whole film away. That was going to be the last scene because she, you know, you probably, you steal something and you see that, you're like, I don't know what this is and throw it away. These big old real right. threw them away, probably threw them away. So, you know, somewhere out there, I tell her thank you for doing what she did because then P being a genius, like, we about to start all over and we about to knock this rest of this out and we're going to do it. We're going to do it, you know, just straight ad lib it. And, you know, but he still yep. set the scenes for you to let you know this is the scene, this is what's going to happen. You know what I'm saying? So P, we really did two movies, and he paid for two movies to be shot. But he was such a genius, wow. he didn't crack when that happened. He just was like, when we get back to New Orleans, we about to shoot all these other scenes. And we, I didn't find out, you, you know, that, okay, all that stuff was stolen until way after that. He just had us thinking we were shooting a lot more scenes which was good for me because oh, wow. it gave me more scenes. You know what I'm saying? And so, and good for everybody. So a lot of people don't know that, that what they saw wasn't actually going to be the total movie like that. Now, that's an exclusive right there. And um, as I said, we got to take it back a little bit because you from being from New Orleans, um, you know, King... You know, Sam Manchin, Chilo, tell you I'm just a nurse. I got to shout out, you know, all your blocks out there. I got to shout out Magazine Street. I got to shout out Claiborne. I got to shout out Broad. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I got to yeah, shout out, yeah, man, yeah. you know, um, you know, um, Bourbon. Uh, and also, too, man, when you said you played basketball, it immediately to me came to mind about some of the legends that come out of that area, like Ronnie Henderson, you know, Randy Livingston, Chris Jackson. Hell yeah, Randy. became yeah. Mahmoud Abdul. Yeah, Mahmoud Abdul Raoul. Well, I'll put it like this. Which, uh, you, when you say Chris Jackson, and I want yes, everybody sir. to listen out here, y'all crazy about Steph Curry, and I love Chef, Chef a Beast. Def but Abiz. goddamn, but, was Chris a monster? Chris, of Jack, Chris Jackson was was Steph before Steph was Steph, yes, and yes. and I'll put anything on that. Chris Jackson was Steph Curry before Steph Curry. Yes, you know what I'm was. saying? And anybody that know basketball know that. You yes. know what I'm saying? Yes. So yeah, 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 man. We have a rich we have a rich sports le- uh, legacy from New Orleans, from Louisiana. Period. You know what I'm saying? Right there in Mississippi, which is right down there. But we have, we have, I mean, we, we have a rich sports history, man. I mean, we have Hall of Famers from here. We have all types of, man, you name it. You know, so, yeah, man, man definitely look, man, a good shout-out. Look, man, you mentioned uh, Grambling, too, you know. So we got a shout-out, you know, the late, great Eddie Robinson. We got a shout-out to oh, William. Man. You know, uh, yeah. I mean, of Doug course, Williams, yeah, you know man. I mean? Everton yeah, man, Walls, of course, Tyran Matthews. Yeah, Everton Walls, yeah, man. Tyran Matthews, yeah. the Honey Badger. Um, yeah, he went to the high school. You, I went to St. Aug, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah Leroy, man, I mean, you know, um, you, got, you got all of them. Fournette, everybody, yeah. Yeah, Leonard Fournette, shout out to him. Um, you know, and it's Tyron wild. Tyron Hughes, man, tell, stuff, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, and when you were telling us. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. No, you go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I'm going to yeah, but when, but when you were telling us the story about a lot of everything, you know, with E-40 in the Bay Area, um, mm-hmm. and King knows this as well, but, uh, you know, on a show, we always strive to give our listeners as much history as we can in terms of mm-hmm. people really understanding the context of all of this. Because everything you said, I understood everything because I know all the history, and King does as well. I mean, of course, he was in Richmond, California, and got game from Uncle St. Charles. You know, oh, yeah. uh, in terms mm-hmm. of when he Definitely. opened up the, uh, he, you know, the record, you know, No Limit Record Store, of course, um, you know, E-40 was the ambassador of the Bay. A lot of people don't know that's where he initially had started out there. And yeah. um, we get, also as well. It, 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 go ahead, go ahead. No, nah, I'm going to tell you some, you know, that people, you you hitting on a lot that some people don't really know. E-40 was the first right. rapper to get a multi-million dollar deal. If people go Good back job, and look right at the cover, the source cover, yeah. And he had the $2 million deal, the all-white pool table. The Bay was was really the ambassadors of that independent movement, along with, on the other end, Luke Skywalker and, and um, Magic Mike and them. You know, people don't know. People don't know that even, even people don't show the respect to Luke Skywalker, number one, 
for the simple fact, you know, he went to jail Shout basically Luke, for freedom yeah. of speech. Yeah, for yeah, freedom of speech yeah. for us to be able to be on radio and, and doing what we're doing on social media. But E-40 in the Bay with Two Short and all them, they was the original selling out the trunk. They was the original independent guys. And, and P learned from St. Charles. I remember we got up there. He would bring us to these record stores, City Hall and all them, and, and got to meet St. Charles, you know, and, and E-40 and be legit. You know what I mean? You know, the, the, the Spice Swans, the Two Shots, these dudes were making, selling hella records before they even got their deal. And, you know, if you ever flew into Oakland, when I first was flying into Oakland, it was daytime, like morning was coming. And right. the, this is how big these guys were. When he was flying in, the, 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 the pilot would tell you, if you look to the left, that is MC Hammer's house. Now, we're talking about a, a pilot on a major airline telling you where MC right. Hammer's house is on this, on this ridge. And then he lets you know, this is E-40's house, you know, Bay Rapper E-40. And I'm like, wow, you know what I'm saying? And then when you get to meet 40, the coolest dude, and then he went to Grambling, you know what I'm saying? So he had a Louisiana yeah. connection, you know, because he was big to us. So, because he went to Grambling because he played band. He played yeah. band at Grambling State. Yeah, yeah. definitely. And, and he knew yeah. one of our legendary greats, uh, DJ Jubilee, who was at Grandma, who was, you know, arguably responsible part of the response for the bounce craze in New Orleans. So, you know, he's one of the architects also. Yeah. You know, we can't forget, and we can't forget Fifth War Weeby either. Rest in peace. Oh, man. Rest you in know, peace, uh, man. Oh, man. That's, that's, man. Um, you know? Yeah. Uh, kind of like, yeah, it hit me kind of, you know, we, we were just in Chicago. Before that happened, mm-hmm. when he came out to the tour and performed with us, you talking about a little a little guy that he was funny man. He he was always the life of of any situation man. Nicest dude, but hard working man. And and you know he he's not gonna just be a legend rap wise. He's a legend within New Orleans. He's a legend within just just being who he was. You know, to be around him, right. man. If you look at any picture or any video, we always, everybody always, whoever around him, they laughing. And, you know, and, and the thing about it was, man, it was so all of a sudden, you know, and, and he knew what he had to do to lose weight and things like that. And he was, he was, he was starting to do it, you know what I mean? And things like that, man. And that, that was, that was a, a big blow. Cause in New Orleans, yeah. we suffer so many losses, man. I think we one city that so many rappers have either lost their life tragically you know what I'm saying, or just lost their life, whether it's from health. You know, we I think we won right. a city that has sold a lot of records that we have lost so many rap artists and music individuals, you know, especially this year. We lost a few, you know what I'm saying, DJ Fest, who was pretty big, you know, architect with from Partners in Crime to Stuff with No Limit, him and DJ Don Juan. You know, we lost uh, uh, DJ Black and Mile. I mean, uh, yeah. crazy yeah. who who's on No Limit, you know, Air West, you know what I mean? We've lost, man, we lost Weeby, we lost, I mean, we've lost, we've lost a few, man. I mean, I don't want to miss anybody's name, but we've lost a few this year, man. And 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 it, yeah. and it continues to happen, man, so you got to celebrate life while they're here, man. Celebrate people while they're here. Gotta give the people the and you know, and you know, no. yeah. And um, yes. you know that's why we're so that's why we're so humbled and blessed to have you here, man. Because one thing uh, we always uh, want to do on this show, you know, we've interviewed, you know, we interview everybody, and you know, mm-hmm. we always me and King talk on the air, we talk off the air, and we always want to show respect as much as we can to artists like yourself while y'all are still here to let you know how much we appreciate what you all have brought to us. You know, in the mm-hmm. game, man. Um, yes, you know, thank, uh, you. thank you and, very much. And, w- mm-hmm. and when you mentioned KLC or B side of town, you know, it's funny because when you said I'm about it, a lot of people don't know this story about how that piano riff came about because he was in the studio <laughs> one night and he yeah. was just mad as fuck because he could not get that uh, that melody, that rhythm that he wanted. So then his daughter yeah. got into the equipment and started messing with the equipment. And he had to, you know, and he had to, and he had to, you know, um, he had to give her a little smack on the behind because she was messing with the stuff. But when he went back and looked at what she did, he was like, that was the exact rhythm that he was trying to find. 
that's yeah, how that cord is. came about. Yeah, because yeah, of his daughter, and, that and nobody, cord. And he, but he was making that beat for me. That oh, was okay. That was okay. Yeah, that but you know, you know, and I always tell people, you know, because when he uh when we did it, um, you know, when P of course when P heard it, you know, he want, he needed to do a commercial. Right. Okay, so I mean, but you know, the funny thing about it is that now the now um, you know, I was a young nigga when the, when the album, you know, when all when No Limit was really beginning to take off. Because actually, and I want to get back to you about this too, because you were in Virginia, and I'm actually from Virginia, Hampton Road, South Side, seven five seven two up two down. Um, you know, so you know, so we in VA. So this is a time that Rap City and Yo MTV Raps are like, you know, that's where we will finding out about all these artists so it was a, yeah. I believe a 1995 show and Rap City did a show with New Orleans you know did a show in New Orleans with uh, No Limit and that's when they played yeah. Doubt It Doubt It and because uh, it had everybody you know I still remember the end of the show and everybody said I thought we told you Classic. we know Linda Soldiers I thought we told you and it has like you know C Murder P you know air all the whole crew in there and um and then I heard this joint called Bout About It, and I was like, and it was, I mean, I never heard nothing about it because that was, what, 1995 when True, The Real Untouchables, that was when the debut album, True to the Game, you know, True, the self-titled album came out. And, I mean, I heard that for the first time, and I was like, whoa. <laughs> yeah. Hey, but you know the thing story. about it? Hello? Mm-hmm. Hello? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, I'm here. The thing, yeah. yeah the, the thing about it, man, um, when Kay was doing that, excuse me, I'm sorry, I know I uh, had a little difficulty right quick, but the thing about oh, it ahead, with that ahead. song, with that song and that style, the thing about it was when I was on the East Coast and, and Onyx had never know this, right? They, they'll know it now, but they didn't know this. The group Onyx, I used to study them. And I was like, mm-hmm. imagine we real rowdy, you know, just doing rowdy songs on on slow beats like that, but talking, I would talk from down south. You know what I'm saying? And mm-hmm. so when I sat with, you know, Kay and we talked and, and, you know, we would talk music more than we would do anything. And so when he was making them about it, because I had did my first performance where I opened up for the late great Soldier Slim, uh, the the legendary Joe Black, you know what I'm saying? And um, at this club, Rumors, you know what I'm saying? That was like the club. Like that was, you know, you had to be real to go, go to that club and be around there. And KL was the DJ there. And um, I I took him, he he redid uh, Gangsta's Paradise for me. And, you know, the, mm-hmm. tem- the temple, and I had a song called Money and Power. And, and then he did another song for me where, you know, where we took in and sampled uh, MC8 saying, got to get my serve on, but niggas, you don't hit me, though. And cause he was one of my right. favorite artists. You know what I'm saying? And so he don't even know that's where my name came from, his song, you know. And so, okay. well, when he was doing about it, like you said, went through and, and Shelly touched the, touched the key and the chords that she wasn't supposed to. And we were like, okay, we know what we're going to do with the song. And when when Pete, you know, he came in town and he didn't even do a commercial for Q93, the great Q93 radio station with DJ Wild Wayne. And um, when he did it, it was crazy. You know what I'm saying? Where you know he did it, and it was like, man, it's hot. And then he let, and knowing him being who he is, he went to Pride, and he was like, man, I got the hottest song on the radio, and it's just a commercial. So when they heard it, you know, next thing you could tell, something big had happened because he was like, yo, everybody, you know, about to get straight, we about to get situated. You know what I'm saying? Because he was a guy that made sure we was all right because he didn't want us in the streets. He always made sure we was right. all right before even the huge checks came. And so, you know, you could tell something big had happened in priority because I was, it was doing Mardi Gras and I was kind of chilling and I did a song with Carlos called, uh, uh, bang him up. And Carlos that's like one of the Brody, first time. Right? Yeah. Cause CeeLo, CeeLo's beats, Carlos, Carlos, Carlos Stevens. Yeah. He was part of Beats by the Pound. And, okay, um, yeah. we did okay, a song okay, for the, gotcha, the, the movie. Yeah, we, we did a song for the movie soundtrack, The Substitute. 
and okay, you know, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it was me, C Murder, and that was the first time you ever heard P go uh, because he came in and he was teaching me. He was like something missing on this song. So whenever me and C Murder was going bang him up, bang him up, you hear P say uh, you know what I'm saying? And it was like on the flip side of the single Miami Lights, which Mac Ten did. So it was Mardi yeah, Gras. Yeah. Yeah, so P don't P don't deal with crowds. He's just not that type of dude. And for him, I knew something was big going on because he he, he was like, "Where you at?" And I'm like, "I'm in the hood, man. I'm at the at the parade with my my dudes, my crew, my circle." And you know, he was like, "All right, I'm on my way." I'm like, "Man, what's going on?" So I'm like, "Whatever. I guess maybe he come and tell me he ain't gonna mess with me or whatever. I don't know, man. It is what it is, you know." So he he fought all the crowd, came by me and my my dudes. And he just walked up, he gave me like 10 G's, and he gave me a new tank, like gave me a whole different tank. And I'm like, what's up? He said, your song made the movie soundtrack. He said, chill with your people, but you flying out to L.A. in the morning. And before I know it, man, it's like we out there, and when he when he dropped out it, and people don't know about P, P do not write. He freestyle everything he does. Oh, wow. And, you know what I mean? He do not write, man, period. I've never seen him pick up a notepad. Maybe with I Miss My Homies, because those songs are deep for him where he might jot something. But he don't, he don't, he just sit there and he listen to the beef for about 15 minutes. He'll, he'll freestyle and freestyle. He'll get quiet and he will actually go to sleep while he's freestyling. Wake up and still be on beat and continue freestyling. I'm not lying to you. And so oh, wow. he would then he would then go in the booth and tell him and KL had a chemistry like Dre and Snoop, and he you know and when he went in the booth and was like man press play man, and K pressed that about it and he just did him, you know what I'm saying and you and and for me it was like one of those things like I probably wouldn't have done that on that song I you know I had something similar which later became throw your city up, you know but the way he did it it was meant for him. You know what I'm saying? And, and we, we wanted to make it. So it wasn't no, uh, man, he got out beaten off. Nah, it's cool. You know, because when I first got to No Round No Limit, the CD, I, the, the tape I gave him, we go back to cassette tapes. It had my song, Got to Get My Serve On. And if you listen to, to West Coast Bad Boys, he got a hook on there where he's saying, got, the video, Got to Get My Serve On, but niggas, you going to hit me though. You know what I'm saying? And so for us, man, it was like, you know, and people understand what Master P means. It means I master what you do and do it better, and I'm out hustle you. You know what I'm saying? I'm a master of this shit. I'm a master of everything. And so for us, it was a team thing, man. And and you know, and I always tell people like, man, but yeah, y'all wouldn't even know about about it if he wouldn't have did it the way he did it. If I would have did it, it'd have been different. You know, it would have been whatever it was. But he he did it the right way. You know, and it was okay for it to be his. Yeah, yeah, man, and, and you know what? Uh, and, that, and that set off a firestorm going into '96 and the '97. Oh, yeah. Like you guys was like running on like like a like a juggernaut into the independent scene, and every album y'all would drop was going gold and plat, which was still just something very unheard studied. of, considering you guys was in it. Because we studied and we outworked everybody. I mean, I, I remember days of watching Nas and Puffy Million Dollar Video with the tigers in the cage and the big white furs. And we in the studio and P like, man, look, y'all could be out there partying. You know what I'm saying? And you want a million dollar video? Cool. He said, you know, all you can get in here and work and you will own the arena and the club that everybody else is coming to pay to see, to, to play around and party. And it's your choice. You know? And he was like, I'm going to outwork him. And he would always look and it wasn't no beef with Puffy. You know what I'm saying? Because doing that East West thing, you know, Pac was his guy. So, you know, he stayed neutral, but at the same time, you know, he leaned towards the West where he lived at. And so when he got into music, he looked at Puffy as like, Yeah, he doing it, but I want his spot and then some and I'm out working because then, you know, Puff was doing his thing, but Puff was partying, enjoying the life. Whereas we wasn't with the party and we from New Orleans. It was like life so serious, it was like we gonna work. And we would outwork them. And we see if Puff was coming out on May 2nd, he was going to come out May 2nd. May 9th, see Murder was going to come out. Now it's two against one. May 16th, Mia going to come out. So now it's three against one. We're going to suffocate you. You you will not 
you will not see the light of day after your first week. And that's, you know, we studied. We knew when you was coming out, where they was coming out. He knew these things. You know, he knew how to manipulate the source in, in XXL. You know, if, uh, when you open up XXL, it was 25000 for to have, like, the page, two pages. So, okay, right. he ain't going to pay tw- he, He's not gonna promote one album. He's gonna pay twenty five grand to promote at least eight albums. Then he's gonna tell him, he's gonna ask him, if I do it for three months, you'll drop it down to fifteen grand a month and they'll do it. Like, okay, this motherfucker's buying spending forty five grand but not realizing he just promoted almost twelve albums. You know you what know, I'm saying? So he Go ahead. And it's crazy, sir. And it's crazy, sir, because you know, I actually have the first double L double XL magazine from nineteen ninety seven with P, you know, uh you know, the double cover that had J Z mm-hmm. and P. You know, yeah. and um you know, and uh and you know, this was like one of P's like first real magazine features, you know, where he basically told his whole well I'm not I take that back. Because that was ninety seven, but in nineteen ninety six source it, uh, the source that gave him a cover mm-hmm. story as well. I'm actually looking at my bookcase right now. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I still got all of them. And this magazine, the one he did from 97 was back in October, 1997. It had Master P, it had the green money back drop, and it was like, Master P, you ain't never seen loot yeah, like this. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so, yeah, uh, we, you know, so this see thing, back then, yeah, y'all was doing the young it. Dudes. Yeah. The young dudes will never understand today, and I hate that they miss it. I mean, I, I like all these oh, the characters, yeah. the young dudes, yeah. because but you earn you 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 dreamed of having to be in a magazine or be on the cover. It meant so much. Yeah. It, it it was like you worked to the point that was like honest to God, that was almost like I made it. Look, I got an interview. Like my first my first interview for Double uh, XL. And and then it was like, you know, and I had at that time I had my house, I had cars, you know what I'm saying? And you had your it pit didn't. Bull. Uh, you had the pitbull and the white outfit because I got I remember that yeah. picture. Yeah, 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 my baby <laughs> shiny. Yeah, and it, it, man, I would. Yeah. I, I, I need to find that picture, man. I need that picture, man. Oh, you know what look, I'm saying? Look, look, look. Now you, I'm gonna shoot it. You got to send that to me, man. I'm gonna send it to you. Yes, I will. I, I got will. It. But. But nah, man, it, that meant more to me than all of all of all the possessions that I had, you know. Because as a rapper back then, be, making it in a magazine, you know what I'm saying? That mm-hmm. that was like I made it. They know me. It was a select few, you know. But but P knew P. P was somebody. I'm telling you, man. The dude would tell us, man, go go grab this on the way in. Because me and C Murder and KL and we used to always have the source double XL Murder Dog. You know, he'll tell us, go grab the latest one, and we'll go get it. And he'll just sit there with him and look at him and look through him, but don't say anything. And next, then the next week, we all threw the magazine. We then figured out how to do it and, and do it. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, that's why y'all saw so much of it. And then inside the covers, you know, I mean, that was that was all him, man. He was, that's, you know, he was he was somebody that was going to, He's gonna. He was gonna take advantage of what you really lacked when you thought you was getting over on it. Like whether it was Source mm-hmm. Magazine, Double XL. Like okay, he's spending forty five grand. We getting forty five from this this dude from the south. He a fool. He country. No, but we promoted so much in there that made forty five million or forty five grand. Now who was the fool? Now you know what? Well, there's a similarity with yeah. Master P. I mean, if you look at now, I know you you a big you a b ball head. You've been watching this too. You look at the last dance with Jordan and Pippen. It seems like mm-hmm. he kind of got that same Jordan mentality type drive. Like it's competition, but he, I like I gotta be better than what I'm doing, and or be better than he, my opposition. But see, he but see, he's a, the difference. His drive was like that. His drive was like I'm not gonna lose. He he he's exactly like Mike in that sense. I'm not gonna lose. But he also has a tad bit. He had more of a tad bit of LeBron of I'm gonna put everybody on. I'm bringing my people mm. with me. I'm gonna put everybody on. I'm I'm not you know with Jordan. 
you know, as great as he was, he degraded. He he, he used bullying to try to make make you be better. Where P was more or less like P was more or less like, look, get in there and do what you got to do. But if you don't come through, I'm gonna replace you with somebody else on this next zone. So he used that tactic more or less like, all right, they got a verse open, handle your business. But his drive, while y'all watching Jordan, like you said, that's how he was. It was he was not gonna lose, and he hated losing. I don't I don't care if 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 Puffy album came out the same day as his, and Puffy sold one CD, one one CD more than him. He going at priority. He getting in their shit. And then he coming. And he going to figure it out where that will never happen again. You know what I'm saying? He like, like Jordan and like losing when he lost to Orlando and he wanted them again. That's the type of person P was. If you outsold him, I don't care if you was Prince. The next time you put an album out that next year, oh, he was going to get you. And he wasn't going to forget so yeah, you're right. That you know, when you think about it, that that the similarities was like that. Hmm. Now, let's take it back to when you got into the studio to do your first album, Life Insurance, because we all remember the cover. The you know, yeah, yeah, man. You know, with the widow. You know, and um, you know, you got the suitcase full of money. You know, shout out to Mikhail. You know, Case or Pen and Pixel. You know, graphic mm-hmm. because he did a lot of stuff for y'all. You know, shout yeah, out yeah, to him. Yeah, um, yeah. Tell him, tell him I need my artwork, man. I need, I need to, I need my graph, my graphics for my artwork. So if he's listening, I tell him I asked him a couple of times. I need my graphics for that and the next level, man. Tell him I need those. Well, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, now, I mean, he was a great dude. Good dude. Yeah, so what was it like going into the studio? Because you said KLC and you pretty much had to have that session of how to really, because the aesthetics don't always translate to the art because the art has to be home. So what was it like after you and him went through the processes and the stages of actually you learning the nuances of your cadence, your breath control, you know, Mm -hmm. your flow on the album? And um, actually, what was it like going into the studio for the first time when you knew, like, this was your album, this was your baby, and this was like, you well, were really getting for ready me, to show the world what you had? For, for me, I kind of, I wasn't even really think. I kind of like, you know, I would kind of XP here and there, and he was like, okay, okay, you know, it's coming. So I got to a point, like, you know what, I'm going to shine on everybody else's stuff. If it come, it come, I'm blessed, I'm good. And he walked up one day, and he was like, it's your time. And I just, you know, I was like, are you serious? He was like, it's your time. Do you. I got to go run. And I was like, damn, he's not going to be around. But then I'm like, and KL was like, this is what we wanted. And he was like, do it your way. But you still had to do some things P wanted. He always wanted certain type of songs, but then you do whatever you want. We had creative control of our album. And so for me, right. it was like, it was all those years of, I remember not feeling the respect I needed to feel in New Orleans. I remember the guy from New York disrespecting after I bust his ass freestyling and disrespecting where I was from. You know, it was like, okay, I'm going to do something different from everybody. And Craig B., who was Beast by the Pound, he was my producer. You know, he came along with me and KL. You know, we brought him with us. You know what I mean? And so the one he did, ain't my fault. You know, he's famous for that, definitely. (laughs) And so many other songs And so I think they were happy That it was my time because You know I hung a lot With the producers I was always around them You know what I'm saying so It was more or less like You know I was wondering like man okay Is everybody going to be here for me like they Be here for everybody else And see murder was there basically every day Fiend was there every day Every second every minute every millisecond no matter what I need, he was there. You know what I'm saying? I mean, he'll fly in, he'll listen, see what was missing, you know, and and jump in things. You know, I mean, for me, artists today don't even understand. You know, because I was on a on a on a, a label that was now blowing up, and the pressure it right. was pressure. You know, because I couldn't fail. We had we had number number five albums, number ones, number ones, number ones, number twos, number, and it's like now it's my time. 
And I'm like, man, I cannot be the one that don't get top five. You know what I'm saying? I don't do six figures the first week. You know what I'm saying? And, right. And, I, you know, and I wondered if some people, you know, like like even at party and things like that and, and was nervous. Like, okay, we don't know what he's going to do. But I had the confidence along with KL, and KL didn't play games, man. When it was my time, right. you know, KL was the type, man. We had Pro Tools way back then. It was given to them, but he wouldn't use them. He just stayed with the mm-hmm. ADAS, that tape. He loved that pure sound of the tape. And with him, it wasn't no punching in. Say, for instance, you, you rap to the last, get to your last word on that last ball that, that, that you know, he did 16s back then. And you right. mess up. You He wouldn't punch you in. You had to start all the way over from the top. You know what I'm saying? Mm. And then if he thought you were playing games in there, he would go turn off the air conditioning. You know what I'm saying? And, and we, that, we used to call it the torture chamber because now it's hot in there. And so you're going to get it right, right then. <clears throat> you know, and he he rarely talk. He'll just look at you, do it again. Do it again. Do it again. Man. You know, and I mean, and it was like, and I mean, it, it, it was... It was more, and me having a military background, structure was nothing to me, you know. But but then right. I knew I knew my album meant so much to him because we started together, you know, and we this right. is where we wanted right. to end right. up with a deal, you know. And so we was with the P deal, and this was our time to give the world my style that I wanted to give them, everything, and, and my concepts and my mind my mind frame, and I wanted to pay people back, meaning. If you listen to Life Insurance, you hear me shout out cities and, and, and certain dudes' names. These were guys in the military that that was there for me that I promised if I ever got on. And didn't it wasn't saying nothing bad towards New York, but it was that revenge of, like, I told y'all. You know, I told you. Now this time I'm coming back, and it's an army. It's an army with me because y'all the mecca. You know what I'm saying? And y'all feel entitled. Y'all feel like like y'all y'all some of the greatest artists ever, New York artists. But they they don't put music out. They feel entitled, like they 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 take time. And I'm like, we gonna take it, we gonna take it from you. You know what I'm saying? The West Coast was at at a standstill. It was the beef. The Midwest was strong. The East Coast was acting like they gods and and they don't have to put music out. We was gonna outwork you. And now it was my time. To put my album out, you know, so I was, I was, I was ready. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, I mean, that, that's what it was like doing it. You know, it, it, it meant a lot, man. Everybody's happy. Y'all also introduced the concept that I noticed with all your no limit releases. Y'all had like posse cuts, like you know, soldier songs. Like every yeah. album, y'all would kick a. I kicked the soldier off. Was that what? Well, how did that idea come about? Well, it was more or less. It was. It was like Pete. You know what I'm saying? Because Kale, when he made that well, first Pete soldier beat, you know, and, and Pete did it like that for the TRU album. I mean, I think that's where it came. And you know, once we start performing and and we saw coming out to that, like we gonna come out to that, and we saw how crazy it was. You know, it, it was like, okay, this is what has to happen. Everybody going to have a soldier song, you know what I'm saying, if they cho- so choose to. You know what I'm saying? So, and you know, of course, if you listen to my album, I'm different. You know what I'm saying? So I, I came out, you know, Craig B gave me Let's Get It Started. You know, and, and contrary to believe, man, um, I'm putting out, I'm re-releasing Life Insurance and the next level, but I'm releasing it with audio talking about each session. So people, you know, when that come out in June, you know, throw that plug out there, man. Um, you'll hear how let's get it started and all that was done. But P really started the, the with the soldier thing and mystical myself and um and C Murder were in the military. So you add our knowledge of it with it, you know what I'm saying? And then New Orleans fatigues was an everyday thing. You know, being a soldier was everyday thing. Soldier Slim really made it popular, made it, made the soldier thing what it was. You know what I'm saying? And tell Reebok they need to cut his mama that check, man, out there for those Reeboks that sold more than oh, any yeah, Reeboks man. they ever had. Yeah. Those soldier Reeboks sold more than, than Penny Hardaway tennis Reeboks, than any Reeboks that was ever made. 
you know what I'm saying? But he was the one really put that soldier thing so big. And, you know, so we just was being who we were, you know, with the soldier thing. And and for me, with the, the album cover was very important because, um, you know, I remember people, not too many people, and I'm sure you know, you know, the first commercial I ever had was we pulled up in a, a hearse on Gold Dayton and opened the back of the hearse, <laughs> me and Pete, and then my album came out. And people always ask me the concept and the cover, you know, life insurance, you know, if you look at life, man, your life is built on paper. When you're born, you know, what are you known by? How people know who you are and what you are, what, what, what paper birth you get. Certificate. Birth certificate. Yeah. All right. Throughout your life, what they say, I need, you need, I need your ID and what other form of identification? Your social security card. That's paper. Right. You know what I'm saying? What you live and breathe for and everybody work for. Money is on Money, what? Paper. 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 Okay. And when you die, how do your people get your money? Get get some money to live after you die. What paper they need? Insurance. Your death certificate. Insurance. Your death certificate. Your death certificate. That's insurance. the only right. way you get right. death certificate. And guess what? And, and their family only get money because the life insurance policy has what? It's on what? Paper. Paper. You right. feel what I'm that's saying? Deep. So that... Yeah. So that that was my mind concept, and that's something I thought about when I was in the military, like, that I would want my, you know what I'm saying, you know, and, and P really enhanced it because he was like, man, Mr. Sir, and it was a personal thing, something happened in the Bay where somebody kind of made me mad, and I'm not proud to say it, and, you know, put hands on him. And P was always joking, like, Mr. Sir, I got a life insurance policy for you. Keep playing. And so with him, when he feels something like an idea, okay, 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 we're going to go with that. We're going to go with that. And so, you know, then we talked and I explained my, my concept of life, which is everything you are, you are no bigger than with the piece of paper you have within your life with your name on it. Everything mm. is, is, is paper. Money, death certificate, birth certificate, social security card, life insurance policy, contracts. Everything is what? Paper, paper. You see, I, you know, you know, you got to look at life for people that's listening. How simple what your life is determined by pieces of paper. Sim- something that's simple. Real. When you pass a tr- when you pass a tree and and say, man, fuck that tree. Tree don't mean nothing to me. How paper is made from that tree, the tree of life. Exactly. The tree of life is where tree. paper is made from. So tree your whole life. Oxygen. Think about it. The yeah. tree, like it's the tree of life. You know what I'm saying? And and your whole life is determined from paper that made that is made from a tree. You know, so you know what I mean that's that's where wow. the concept of life insurance came from. That's deep, man. And um, I guess me being a self uh, a self proclaimed tree hugger too, because I'm all about <laughs> recycling and helping the environment. Um, yes. Anybody that knows me will tell you that. Um, I always try to do my part to help the planet. That's real, man. Um, you know, and, and it's, it's it's wild, man, because, you know, you all during that time, I mean, you know, <clears throat> and I don't necessarily want to get too taboo with it, but this is also a situation that we want to discuss, too, because as much of the great success that you and everybody in the crew had uh, within Enola the camp, there were a lot of, um, you know, leavings as well in terms of a lot of artists that would end up, you know, leaving mm-hmm. as well. Um, mm-hmm. You know, of course, Mystical, we interviewed Reginelli last year. You know, he talked to us mm-hmm. about some situations in reference to how some of the, bi- you know, some business uh, that was, mm-hmm. you know, that, it sometimes, that sometimes was not all the way right at certain levels. Uh, I mm-hmm. still have the 2001 um I think it was two thousand. It was a two thousand and one uh, Source magazine where they interviewed uh, Silk about the situation with Mystical leaving, and you know, um, you know, of course, because he had left the year prior with his solo deal on Job, where he had released Tarantula, and even with you, you know, you had left to do your album, you know, Battle Decisions, War Is Me. Um, mm-hmm. You know, uh, from the start of pretty much everybody in terms of where. The uh, tank was rolling. Um, take us through that era of where everything was really great, but then pretty much everybody kind of started kind of going their own directions away from the limit. I think 
you know, when you have T, T was a leader. He was a father figure, uncle, cousin, big brother, a leader. Um, you know, he mm-hmm. he was more of those things than he was a boss because he didn't he didn't you know. And there's no disrespect to any people that I'm about to say. Say you know what I'm saying. You look at like Lil J would rap a lot. The Godfather to us, that's Godfather. You know what I'm saying? And you know, especially the Southern music and the independent scene, he rules with an iron fist. You know what I'm saying? You know, you you had right. Jill who ruled with an iron fist. You know what I'm saying? You had Puffy who ruled in his way, like it was all about him. You know, you know, and right. things like that. You know, I mean, but P was different. You know, it was still family and team. But he was still mm-hmm. he that that person with his head out there. So, you know, when things were at their highest, and they were at their highest, and I always tell people that they like, oh, cash money came. Nah, they didn't take nothing from us. You know, we were the streets. Yeah, they were I want to ask you about that they, too as well. Yeah, we're, yeah, we're, we yeah, we're, we're getting you cool. I'll, I'll let you save that one. But, you know, the thing about it is, <laughs> you know, we got so huge and he was into so mm-hmm. much. He was always there, like always there, you know, right there. So if it was any, you know, anybody felt any kind of way, you know what I'm saying, any form of fashion, he was there like, let's talk, you know, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, he was playing ball. He was doing things. You know what I'm saying? We never had issues at No Limit because the way we believed in things, if you got a problem and it was you feel like it, you was that upset, we we had a set of boxing gloves in the room. You go yeah, in there and you ring, get it off your chest. Yeah, the boxing ring, yeah. Yeah, you, yeah, you know, you, 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 you get it off your chest because we believe if we family and we're a team, you're not pulling no gun on your brother and your family. If it's that bad, go in there, fight, and get it over with and come out here and we go back to doing what we're doing. You know, and that, you know, that, that, that was something that was good because, you know, you just, you know, you had a few go in there, you had some in and some not, and sometimes it just stopped things from happening. And so once he started playing ball and he had so he was being pulled in so many different ways, he wasn't around. Right. You know what I'm saying? As much, you know, and because I can remember doing my album, The Next Level, and, you know, little I know that was going to be my last album. And I remember, like, him calling and saying, I'm not going to make it in to be on your album. And I was pissed. I was upset. Okay. And I and mm-hmm. I ended up doing, like, and C. Murder was mad. He was, because he was doing his album, Boss Loon, and he just, and he was pissed off, like, to the fullest. You know what I'm saying? And right. And so, um, you know, and I definitely, when I, you know, you know, it was like, it was, it was rough. And you start seeing it like, damn, he not here for us. You know what I'm saying? And so, so much was going on. And then we start having outsiders that we never let in. A lot of them were coming around. So it was, it was becoming a separation of a thing where it was like, and, and, and it wasn't P, it wasn't really P fault. P was just P, you know, when you sit down and think like, okay, we all been together all these years. You know what I'm saying? It was like, they know no, they know better. I got love for them. They know that. And, you know, I mean, so you got to really see where he wasn't there a lot, you know, and, 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 and when he would, would come in, you know, he's over here and his guys and we're over here, you know what I'm saying? And, and things like that. And for him, everything was okay. You know what I'm saying? I mean, but if, 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 if it was any issues, it would be told to him by somebody that really, you know, people that just, just, just didn't, didn't. They didn't have our dedication, our commitment, blood in, blood out, TRU to the death of us. They didn't. They some of them right. was not like that. So he would hear things for different handed, and so you know it got to a point where he wasn't around as much due to trying to still build and keep things better for us. And I understood that. And so when things the and then the bigger you got, you know you had, you know now it was like okay we want this company. So he was fighting to make sure everything was always good with priority and different situations and renewing and doing the biggest, best deal that's possible for us. You know what I mean? And so for me, I believed in family. And, you know, and once B spot a pound and him, they had their disagreement, but it really wasn't a disagreement. It, it, it was, it was, you know, they just didn't get to talk. And so once right. him and KL kind of went their ways, which KL never really wanted to, and 
P P is a very pro. The only one thing I'm always say about P that the only one flaw he got. The dude has the greatest heart in the world, but he don't know how to say say. But let me holler at you, my fault. You know, right? And KL right. is quiet. Right. Where he's not going. He's not going. He's not. But but P is the type. He'll do something, not just monetarily. He he'll be like, okay, me and me and sir will be all right next month. You know, but within that month, you got to look at life where we now grown now, and we all right, have time right, to like right. became our <laughs> own entities. Where it's like, and so when him and KL kind of parted, which was a shocking, we were so dedicated to the point like, man, we ain't working without Beast by the Pound. And then P was more or less like, instead of trying to find out what was going on, he had so much going on. And I think nobody realized the pressures he had. And, and But he's yeah. so proud, like, all right, if people feel in this way, they can go ahead about their business. You know what I'm saying? And then when you got people around him that was starting to be around him, you know what I'm saying? You know, new people around him, like, yeah, he's saying this or he's doing that and, and blah, 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 blah. He distanced himself because New Orleans is a serious place. And he knew, okay, yes, if I is. go approach this <laughs> yes, one, if I go, if I go approach this one, I'm not no bitch and he ain't no bitch. It's going to be murder. It'll turn out bad. So the love for you, the love he had for us, <laughs> and the love we had for him, you just said I'm gonna stay my distance. And for me, I got caught in the middle of him and KL when KL Ooh. left, and P was like, "Yo, that's your people." And when I'm talking to KL, KL also had the rest of Beats by the Pound to think about. So his decision of like, man, I, I, you know, I want to come back, man. Tell him, let's talk. And P was more or less like, no, nah, I want to tell him come talk to me. And it was two two stubborn people that loved each other that would not come. And then the people in between made it worse. And so once they parted, you know, I was somebody, you know, they was getting newer artists and things like that. So now for me, I'm looking at my third album, which was going to be huge. I'm coming off a number one album. And so – right. You know, but for me, I could feel like where P, if I saw him, you know, hey, what up, sir? What's going on? You know what I'm saying? But then it was like certain things he would kind of really distance. You know, I felt the distance because it was like, like I'm not fucking with Kale no more. Kale ain't fucking with me, but that's your people. And in New Orleans, that's how it goes down when things be the way they be. Like, man, you was cool, but I mean, your people ain't fucking around, so I don't know where you at with it. So, So when I'm feeling that, you know what I'm saying? And it was nothing new to the, nothing bad towards the new producers. You know, I really liked them, you know what I'm saying? But it was more or less like, man, this is my dudes. I'm, I'm not working with them. I, I don't know. So now I'm caught in the middle. So me being my own man, and he raised me to be my own man. So I was like, you know what? It's, it's not family no more. This shit hurt me to watch this. I can't do this. I'm burnt out. Let me step away. So for me, it wasn't about money. You know what I'm saying? Yes, as time went on, right. when I learned the business more, you know, and I could tell, to, you know, you had people in between that that didn't want some artists to, to make the money they should. Not P, because P was the type of person when you didn't have albums out, you know, we had houses and we had cars in our name. That's unheard of. You know, our deal was, my deal with him and wasn't on paper. It was a handshake, man to man, fifty fifty. You keep your publishing, and you get fifty percent of your album. You know what I'm saying? That was unheard of. People like LL, my idol, was getting seven to ten percent with Def Jam. I'm getting fifty percent. So, you know, and the dude, you know, it, it it was it was more or less for me, man. I was partially burnt out with it, and then most of it was like it hurt to see the separation. And I felt kind of by myself once KL and left. And it was like, you know what? I don't want to fall out with my dude who, who I feel like gave me the greatest chance in life. And then I don't want my dude over here who I came with to be mad at me here. So I'm like, you know what? I'm going to take my own journey this way, you know, but I'm going to take some time off. So for me, that's that's that was my thing because... If you listen to Wars Me Battle Decisions, you hear me say it in the song, how much I miss them, how much I miss No Limits. Right. You know what I'm saying? But I'm like, okay, I had to walk my own walk and do what I had to do. I have a son watching me right now. 
You know what I'm saying? And it was it was a depressing time because people saw me, yeah, I had the big deal with Selecto Hits and, and putting our words me charted on Billboard. But I was hurting during that time, man, because I missed my brothers. I missed my family because KLM was over that way. They didn't know if I was still affiliated with P. P felt like, hey, you, you, you done left and you must be dealing with them. I'm going to stay my distance over here. And so it was like, damn, you know, the people I started out with and we did so much, they both kind of like distant in so many ways. Even though KL did something for me on, on War Is Me, you know, he still was cautious because I was coming to him like, man, you got to holler at P. And I was talking to P like, man, man, he want to holler, bro. He said, well, I talk to him by himself. You know what I'm saying? And And it was just like, I got caught in the middle, so that was my thing walking away. I, I can't sit down. I'm not going to ever tell you, oh, it was about money, because when I walked away, I still had money from the next level, you know, because with No Limit, when you turned your album in, P gave you, say you shipping 500000 times $10, mm-hmm. that's $5 million. He's going to get, he gets, he he got 50% of that up front, so he might have got two point five. He was going to give you your check half of that money up front before the album even sold. So you still oh, had shit. money. You know what I'm saying? Our right. houses were paid for and given to us as gifts, not recouped. You know what I'm oh, saying? Wow. So, you know, when I turned in life insurance, he gave me a $60,000 Corvette, something I always wanted, which when they changed the new body style in 97, I went to Bowling Green, Kentucky and picked it up. Number 32 off the line. He gave me that. No, no recruiting hmm. or nothing. He was like, you know, so he was, you know, we was different from other labels. We were on payroll to keep you from going in the streets and hustle and mess up before your album come out. You were paid like twenty five hundred dollars every two weeks. And then if I got on your album, if I got on three songs, I got a thousand dollars for each verse I was on. So see, if y'all really Shit. look now, you see why people was always on everybody's song. Cause everybody you know, was so, paid. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I mean, oh, wow. but you know, a lot of things with money, man. And I always say this with P I never, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and never believe that he purposely said, I'm not going to pay you some of this money that you don't know you're making. You know, when it boiled down to it, even financially, he had people basically stealing from him and getting no, you know what I'm saying? And, and, and things that he didn't even know because when you get that big, you cannot say account for every dollar. You feel what I'm saying? And so, you know, right. coming to him and say, hey, bro, I feel like I was supposed to have this amount and why I didn't get this amount. You saw a dude that would give you his last and had so many pressures. He's like, you know what? He'll figure it out. He'll make sure I'm okay. You know, and he was that type of dude, like, what's wrong? But, but at that point in time, he was never around. You know, because he was he was doing so much, and then the basketball thing was a, such a dream. And so you didn't want to get mad at him, like man, this company falling apart, bro. Things ain't right. Why you gone? But you out here playing ball? No, I knew that was his dream. We all knew that. Yeah. You know, so you yeah. know, and and you know, because he would never miss albums. You know, so I think yeah. everybody had their reason for leaving, and whatever it may be. You know, whether, like you said, whether it was a Reginelli, what his, whatever went on with their business, I don't know. I, that's like my little bro, love him still to this day. But Understood. I know my Understood. reason. Yes. My reason, it wasn't family anymore. And and I felt like I was caught in the middle, you know, and I just wanted to walk my journey, man, and do, you know, do what I I was taught by him to do. You know, so that, that you know what? You know, going- it, we, 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 hmm? Yeah, I was going to say, and going back in that time period where, from now going going back to '98, where you guys was at Jeff at this point, y'all guys was like, I would say the Chicago Bulls of '97, '98, because then you guys added <laughs> Snoop Dogg to the family. Yeah. Y'all yeah, added Snoop that was to the that family. was. Now, how did how did how did he fit in with you guys? He fit in well. That was on. You know what I mean? What what you gonna do? You gonna look at him and say, "Yeah, we the top dog, and you need us right now." You know what I'm saying? Nah, you still he still walked up, and that was that was like God to us rap wise. You know, it was still respect, and he taught us things. 
you know, I can remember doing my album, um, The Next Level, and we were in L.A. I was so happy to be around him, the dog pound, everybody, man, badass, rest in peace, man, my, my Hennessy drinking partner, you know what I'm saying? And, you man, know, we missed you him. Know, man, we and, missed him. And we, oh, man, that man, was, was my about dude, us, bro. Man. And, and doing, my, doing my album, man, that was my dude. And, um, you know, I remember telling Snoop, like, yeah, man, I want to go to swap me, get some beefy tees and corduroy slippers. He was like, nephew, sit your ass still. You don't know when you're going to, you going to ever, when this going to be, this going to be taken from you. Say, look at me. I'm trying to get life over here, over here with y'all guys, you know, and I'm, I'm Snoop. He said, get in here and work, man. You got people go do that, man. Every day, man, you're supposed to be working and doing what you got to do. Don't take it for granted, man. Fuck them slippers. And at first, I'm sitting back, and I'm like, Snoop is slim. You know what I'm saying? I'm big. I'm bigger than Snoop body-wise. And I'm like, man, this is like one of my idols, and he's kind of handling me. And then, you know, it's like, and he saw it in my face, and he was like, nephew, go do your work. Don't worry about that. Got that. You know what I'm saying? And... I, I, I understood, you know what I'm saying? And the next day, I had all these things that I asked for where he sent somebody to do it. He was like, don't ever take this for granted. Things like that we needed because at that point, we was the label and we knew people was trying to bring us down. We had so much going on, man, that, that and peace shielded us from it, whether it, was, whether it was the feds investigating, trying to see who we really were. You know, I mean, other little people saying little things. You had a few rappers put their little songs out, you know, and things like that. But, you know, Snoop was more of a teacher, man. And, and he was a, 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 a big brother, an uncle, a, you know, a friend, you know what I'm saying? So to have somebody who I used to look, had posts used to be on my wall that I used to wake up and go to sleep to fussing at me about do your music and do what you got to do, man, that was a fucking honor, bro. You know, so, you know, that that was, it was like, you know, you got to imagine seeing him walking our trailer. We were shooting, I got the hookup, I think. And you, like, had to double tape. Like, you, you, you like, damn, he's tall, man. Damn, but he's slim. But damn, nigga, that's Snoop, no? Huh? It's like one of them, you calling your mama, bro. You, I called my mama, and at the time, I was uh, married, so I, and I, I called my, my ex-wife, of course. And I call like, yo, I just, Snoop is, is like sitting like three feet, six inches across from me. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like Snoop, the real Snoop dog. I'm serious. I was calling everybody I could call. And here, not thinking that I'm serve on. You know what I'm saying? I'm a name now. I'm on the biggest label in the world. He coming our label. None of that matters. I'm like, that's Snoop. You know what I'm saying? This, this really Snoop okay. dog. I'm like, this. This 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 corrupt. This dance right there. That's Nate dog. Motherfucking Nate dog. Like oh no. And it, I'm talking about this Nate dog, man. <laughs> and you it's know, crazy, it's a, sir, because shit. yeah, man, it's crazy, sir, because there are certain elements in hip hop history that just just live in all types of uh, of legend. Of course, mm-hmm. you know the incident with Puff Daddy and Steve Stout. You know, uh, mm-hmm. you know, fr- you know, and then of course, and we still get bugged out about this. He bought Snoop's contract from Suge Knight, and that was to this day over twenty twenty two years later. That is still like just one of the most. Well, the we're just dumbfounded ever. by. It. <laughs> Dude, but you know something though. But, but, but you, but you know yeah. something though. When you look at when you look at life. And say Suge felt like he ain't worth it no more. I ain't tripping. You know what he could do for me because all that had happened with Pac and everything. And right. you know, and you know, for 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 P, that's who he was. He's he he take the challenge, and it's like, man, Snoop was one of my favorites. And then and then P also, man, P P can be a bit messy. And his thing was like, man, we gonna get Snoop. I ain't tripping on that role. We ain't scared of them. Everybody else scared of them. We're not scared of them. And it wasn't no, you know, like we had an issue, like, you know, and 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 the funny thing about life, and I'll tell you something funny to jump back to this. When we first was coming mm-hmm. up, and we was in a, a big conference in Miami, when the East and West right. was beefing, you know how we met Fat Joe was 
they he got jumped on by some West Coast rappers, and he was we was in the in the he was like thirty deep, and we was in the lobby, and he came in with the red mark on his eye, and he was like, "Y'all right?" He said, "Okay," and he told him what happened. He was like, "All right, okay." So our thing was the only way we gonna make ourselves relevant. Who was the biggest label at the time? Death Row. So we right. actually was going to jump them, jump on them, like to make a name for ourselves. You know what I'm saying? Which would have been the dumbest thing to do. You know what I'm saying? It would have put us in a predicament of, of you know, on a line, down the line, wrong, you know, wrong line. And you got to think, Snoop was with him that day and everything. So now you jump back right. all these years, and P is like, I want Snoop. One, I want help him. I feel like he still got it. You know what I'm saying? And he missing, and he always, he said, it. he was like, man, this dude could be making so much more money than what he's making. Right. And then it was right, also right. like, okay, they say, they say Suge, and Suge, you know, Suge had his place in history that people will not disagree with me. If Suge wasn't that bad guy when it came to going into those, those offices, you know what I'm saying, where they was already giving people slave contracts and being that bad guy, and then they, they learned not to play with black men. They learn not to play games with their money and try to cheat. Yeah. He he brought that fear like, okay, a black dude really will walk in here and not you know and whatever. He 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 brought that element that changed some things on how they dealt with us. You know what I'm saying? That but true. at that time, that you know true. you know, at that time he was the boogeyman, like people would say, and P was the type like, Okay. I'm, you know what? I'm gonna do this deal with Snoop, and, and nobody gonna touch him. I'm gonna take, I'm gonna take Snoop from that road, and that, you know, and that's him. You know what I'm saying? But he still did it more out of love. You feel what I'm saying? I mean, and then you got to think that was like saying we traded, we traded for, you know what I'm saying? Like, like the thing people say we traded for Kevin Durant. You know what I'm saying? Right. I use something I heard Snoop say. We got Kevin that's Durant now, like Golden State did. Like Kev, like Golden State did. We was already winning championships, you know what I'm saying. But now right. we got we got Snoop. Now we unstoppable. You feel what I'm saying? Because I felt like with Mystical, when we got Mystical, we was we was rolling. We was doing what we was doing. We got Mystical at a time when Mystical was hot, and he was big. It was like we got Jordan. You know what I'm saying? Like okay, now it's over now. You know what I'm saying? Like well, bit better yet, we got Pippen. Jordan, P was already Jordan and doing what he was doing by himself with us, and we 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 ball, and then we get mystical. We got Pippen, we start winning championships. We go get Snoop, like go and get Durant. It's over now. You know what are you gonna do? We got the whole West Coast in the world. We got the West Coast even more so now. Then we got the world that Snoop bring. You know what I'm saying? And we already was starting to take over the world. So and I it's, mean, and it's wild, yeah. man. I mean, you all, but I mean, also too, even in that time having Snoop on the label, you know, because that's when, because I guess this is somewhat of a perfect segue because it showed how you were reaching from different elements. How did that collaboration mm-hmm. with Big Pun come about with the NY to NO? How did that happen? Okay, what what it was was, I was a big fan, you know, in 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 New York never left my mind what I was done. Right. When I was laughed at and they turned their back on me. And so right. Mia had did the song with Fat Joe. And so I was one of the type, me and C. Murder would always get in trouble because we would be going to clubs and go to people concerts and stuff when people would tell us like, man, look, I told you I don't be going out there in the streets. And so they were in town. And so I just came to represent No Limit and went to the House of Blues and Pum knew who I was, which was, man, because Pum was the shit at that time. He was number one. Yeah, man. And I was always a big fan of Fat Joe, Jealous One's Envy album. You know what I'm saying? And Joe, Joe, Joey Quack, Joey was a real, real one. So I was like, yeah. man, I definitely want to do some do something with you. Pum say, man, let's do it, because me already did it with Fat Joe. And so right. my thing also was, my thing also was, I promised them dudes that laughed at me I was going to come back. New York, I was going to come back. You know what I'm saying? And so the thing was, I went to P and I said, man, I want I want to do a song with Pun. He said, done. He had him get in touch with uh-huh. him. You know, he was like, do whatever the price was. And even Fat Joe was like, damn, the money came quick. You know, he paid for the feature. <laughs> and, you know, so... And so 
my thing was then we get out there, and when we get out there, man, I learned so much. You know, when we get there, Fat Joe picked us up from the airport, held me down. You know, I mean, real dude. You know, and pun, you know what I'm saying, we get the studio. I, I want to enjoy myself. I'm back in New York, and I learned another lesson. You know, I was like, you know, like, man, look, you going to drink that pun? was like, nah, man, let's knock this out. Do your business, man. And when he went in that boot, he 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 went straight through his vocals. One take. Ain't too many people do one takes and don't mess up. That's true. And then did his doubles and don't mess up. Then did his ad libs and don't mess up. Ain't too many and ain't too many artists could even say they do that. You feel what I'm saying? Especially the way he rap. And so you know we we once P heard it and and you know and the name was simple you know N Y D N O and it was personal and. My thing was, you know, before I could say it, Pete said, well, I remember, I remember what you went through. We're going to shoot it in New York. That's all I wanted. And, and a lot of people don't oh, realize, wow. like, I was one of, I was one of the first, out yeah, New York artists that never did video in Times Square. You know what I'm mm. saying? And then we did it at the Fame Tunnel, the club scenes of the Fame Tunnel. You know what I'm saying? You had, you had, uh, what's due, man? What's due, man? We was cool. Uh, of love and hip hop, oh, man. Um, no, 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 no. Of love and hip hop. Uh, the oh, ball oh, dude. I'm out of here. Shame myself, man. Stevie J. You know he was in my video, the first video, Vixen. Uh, uh, she was in my video. Uh, uh, yeah, you know who I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, and uh, yes, uh, 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 Puerto Rican, Dominican. Um, yeah, oh, oh, Gloria she was Valez. in my Gloria Valez. Gloria Valez. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, she was yeah, in my video. Glad. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, she was in there. I had Shaheem in there. Capadonna came. You know what I'm saying? I mean, Met was my guy. He was supposed to come through, but he didn't get to come. You know what I'm saying? I mean, but it was personal, and it was a part in the video. P wouldn't let me, wouldn't let me, wouldn't, wouldn't. He took the edit out. You know, that's the, that's how smart of a businessman he was teaching me. I had one part where I had on like three different tanks, and I took all three of them off. And put them down on the ground in um, on Times Square, and and walked away and just looked in the camera. You know, meaning like we, you know, we got New York, and he was like, "Nah, we're not doing that." You know what I'm saying? And it, you know, and it was like a learn a learning lesson. You know what I'm saying? But I, I it was my mindset of like I told you we would be back, and now we back at a time where we run everything. You know what I mean? And, and New York was so special to me because. You know, that's where the greats come from, man. I idolize LL. I idolize Russell Simmons. You know what I'm saying? I mean, these these were guys just ice, you know what I'm saying, that I idolized. K Solo, you know what I mean? Different rappers from, from you know, from back then, you know what I'm saying, that and Big L and all of them. And then I was prevalent to, to, to be, to see Jay-Z when, he, when Hawaiian Sophie was big because he used to be in Virginia hustling. You know what I'm saying? So mm-hmm. Jay was somebody I knew. You know, yeah, they heard Hawaiian Sophie, but I heard him rap in a whole different way. Like, like this dude is gonna be something fierce, you know, in time. You know, so it, it was important, and that's how we did it with NYDNO. That's what's dope about you guys, wow, man. man. It's like you guys, even though y'all come from different regions, y'all was still observing and respecting each other's cultures, and y'all was. I also had that mutual respect for anybody as long as the music was good and the foundation was good. Mm-hmm. It was really no mm-hmm. territorialism like that. No, nah, we but but we, we, we wasn't gonna be like that and P wasn't gonna let that happen because for the simple fact he saw what happened with East and West. So he wasn't gonna get into right. any type of beefs and then he believed real men don't rap about other men on records. If you got an issue, see me when you see me and we'll deal with you that way. You know what I'm saying? You know, sir. So and, it's, and I got to say this, sir, because, you know, me and King, if there is one, if there is one interview among the over 300 that we have done, there is one interview that always cracks us up. And shout out to OG Bezel, man, because we always laugh about Big shot this to because, uh, <laughs> because OG was so real. That's easily one of the top 10 funniest interviews, but so serious because OG made it clear. <laughs> And me and King talk about this all the time. Southern niggas be different, especially in New Orleans. And if you say another <laughs> man's name on a song, dissing him, oh, gee, oh, God, I'm, laugh- I'm cracking up.
think about oh, yeah. it. We, we, we live by we, <laughs> yeah. I think we we I, we live by a different set of rules, man. You know. Yeah. We live by a different set of rules, man. I mean, you know. So, and that's what really tripped me out even today with the young dudes how they go off on each other on the internet and and talk about each other like that and and you yeah. know and they might run across they might run and they take a each selfie. other. And I, I, yeah, and I and I be sitting back like, yo, in my day and time, yo, that wouldn't have happened, dude. You you say somebody's name back in the day, you know, especially as it was a rap, problem. You, you, <laughs> you when we saw each other, it wasn't no talk. It wasn't no, I'm gonna stand in this corner and you gonna be in this corner, but we gonna do Instagrams about each other ain't real in here like that and and holding the phone up, nah, man. I saw, I saw it with my, I saw the, I saw the realness with my own eyes, man. I saw Dead Row and Luke Skywalker, man. They met like it was a, like it was a battle in an arena, man. You had Dead Row coming one way, Luke Skywalker them coming down. Dead Row talking about bow wow y'all, yippee yippee. Luke Skywalker them was coming down that bitch talking about Miami, and then they just clash because it had been Does a lot of Does anybody even know how that happened? What was that all about? Maybe you can get. I mean, I, but I most... think that was. I, I don't know, man. I think it was something with Dre and them, and uh, um, you know, yeah. I don't know. You know what I'm saying? I mean, and and Luke and Luke. What people don't understand is y'all t- think about that. People think about that ass shaking music, man. Luke was nah, a, Luke real is a real G, and still dude. is. He's a real G, <laughs> and still is a real gangster. Yeah, still is. You know what I'm saying? And 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 when you you have to understand that road was coming. And getting and getting bigger, and Luke was already in Miami. Was already big, and Luke Luke wasn't no joke. He wasn't a game. You feel what I'm saying? So, you know, right. however that kicked off, and then I think it kicked off all the way back from the EZ and NWA days. You know, I guess it was a group thing. Luke, two live crew, NWA. You know, it was bound to happen. And the industry back right. then used to pit everybody against each other so they could make money off it. So it, it might have happened in that way. Who knows? You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, we had to ask that, you know that. because you got the fourth person that we interviewed that said they were there that day. So we may have to do like a <laughs> no, documentary no, or something. We was, on the we, was, <laughs> we, was front, we was front and center, and to the right of us, Jermaine Dupree and Escape was like, because it was elevated right there, and they had an escalated, and, and them came down the escalator. I mean, I saw motherfuckers get thrown off. Look like from one part of the escalator into a fountain. I mean, it was, it was they was Damn. fighting for real. And see, it wasn't like the day where somebody will always grab a pistol and you know these little scary, scary little dudes. Not all of them scary. I'm not you know disrespecting the young dudes because you know what I'm saying this this was when you know maybe security one or two might had a gun. Yeah, you had to right. be a man. It, it was you no had, M joy. You had to be a man. Yeah, you had to be a man no matter what size you was. It was going now. You know what I mean? I watched now, Lady of Rage punch some, I watched Lady of Rage punch somebody, man. It was real. <laughs> it was it was, <laughs> it was real, yeah. Shout out to Rage you know, but, in Farmville VA, man. The Afro Puff Oh uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, man. definitely, man. But you know, now, Carolina, man, and the, the East Coast played a big part in, 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 in my music career and who I was. You know what I'm saying? Virginia, yeah. Norfolk, Virginia, you know, where my oldest daughter and my grandbaby at right now. You know, I gotta shout okay. out my I gotta shout out my, my daughter, my oldest daughter. She she has her own business called Essential Grills. She's the she's the grill lady. She do all the grills. Essential okay. grills, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, man, in Norfolk, Virginia. She's pretty big. She's That's blowing up. That's me. something she did on her own. That's something she did on her own. You know what I'm saying? I mean, but you know, but that played a big part for me. You know what I'm saying? I mean, that's that's, you know, you know, I played the song early HBCU. You know, which HBCUs mean so much to me, and that came from being, you know, on Norfolk State campus and and seeing the yeah, Hamptons and the Howards cool. play and and cool. the Virginia States and the, and A A and T being on John C Smith campus, Winston Salem. You know what I'm saying? And Shaw. I mean, being around all that time and. You know, I was blessed to uh, meet one of my basketball heroes. I'm a North Carolina Tar Heel fan, man, big time. And so I got to talk to George Lynch. And him and Miss Tracy Pennywell, you know, they put together a thing doing this COVID-19 situation. 
to uh, mm-hmm. help the student athletes, you know, get computers. Because a lot of them, you know, surprisingly in America today, you have some black kids that are in college that don't have computers. And so, oh, you wow. know, we did this telethon just recently, COVID-19 telethon, um, you know, and those two put something together with a couple other people, you know, some pretty big, you know, Miss Tracy Pennywell and George Lynch, who was actually coaching at Clark of Atlanta at one time, and he saw how bad the kids, they didn't have kids at Gramlin. I mean, all these schools, the student athletes did not have computers at home to finish their courses. And if they didn't, they were basically, you know, they can fail. And so, you know, we got together and that's why I did the HBCU song, which is out on our platforms. And and every every time it's paid for and downloaded, you get on iTunes, Spotify, everywhere, that money goes back to HBCUheroes.org, you know what I'm saying, to, to help these you know, and then we talked about it, you know, how, how big HBCUs are into my heart, you know, where I want kids to go there. I want the kids that's there to, to have what they need, you know what I'm saying? Because I feel like HBCUs are forgotten, you know, so that's my cause right now that, that I'm very, very deep into, you know what I'm saying? You know, so anybody out there listening, please, man, download that song, go pay for the download, you know what I'm saying? And, and you'll be helping an HBCU student in need. You know, is it called HBCU for Life, produced by Sharon Productions out of Atlanta? You know, so it's a big, important song to me. You know, you know, I come from the land of the best band. Everybody going to get mad when I say this, you know, Southern University, the jukebox. But you're going to leave that alone, man. I want nobody to get mad at it. No, it's all good, man. Because I mean, look, <laughs> uh, you know, when, look. I mean, I, I mean, I go to North State. You know, uh, that's you know, uh, yeah, yeah. that's my school. But uh, we, you know, but Florida A and M, Grambling, you know, we respect everybody. You know, I was on that. You know, I was on that campus for a short time, short period of time before I got in trouble, right? I was okay, enrolled okay, there. okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man. Um, uh, uh, Trojan yeah, helmets, I understand. Uh, yeah, man. You know, yeah. With the Spart- yeah, um, for the Spartan Legion, man, for what yeah. we do out there, it's this, this, uh, this. The thing is about it is that, um, I and like you said, sir, uh, because a lot of my family, you know, has gone to HBCUs. You know, my mother, um, mm-hmm. she's a doctor. She, mm-hmm. uh, you know, uh, she got a doctorate from Virginia Tech, but she did her undergrad studies in Norfolk State, Hampton, and Virginia mm-hmm. State. And um, you know, of course, my uncle, he's one. He doctor, he he got he went to North State. I mean, it's the the legacy of HBCU is so rich and essential. And I think yeah. a lot of times, you know, one thing about it is that um, it's it, it's just such a sense of community, it's such a sense of pride, it's such a sense of it's, identity it's culture. in terms of what it it's, represents. It's heritage. Yes, it's culture. It's yes, culture. It is. It's heritage, yes, it is. and I think. It's, it's, it's blackness at its best for me because when you step on the HBCU campus, these kids, every kid on that campus, every kid, every black kid on that campus, they're going, you, you are looking at people that are wanting to be something in life. You know what I'm saying? And, and they're, they're going about it this way because they can't afford to go to this major university or they wasn't accepted at this major university but when they leave from there they are some of our greatest lawyers scientists doctors you name it accountants you know what i'm saying i mean engineers you know not just athletes you know what i'm saying i mean and and it's a culture you know to the point of like for me being from the hood and going on xavier university campus and i'm like it made me want to be a part of it when you see the greeks and the, and the step shows and everything. And then you seeing like this dude and he going to class, like they're doing something with their life. And and you're seeing people right. that look like you, look like you, like they're not thugging. They're, they're trying to, they're going to be somebody, you know what I'm saying? They, they, you know, you look at them and see, they got a better chance to make it, but not knowing it's hard for them. But then a lot of them come from a legacy. Like you said, your uncles, your father, you know, different people. And it's, 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 it's such a unique situation where it's, when you look at universities like big, these other, you know, big, big universities, say UCLA, you might have had, okay, mom and dad met there, they went there, and maybe the son go there or whatever, would not. But, okay, they can afford it. Where now you're looking at the fact his dad went there, his dad's dad went there, his dad's dad's dad went there, 
you know, went to Cork in Atlanta or went to Tuskegee, you know what I mean? And, and, and HBCU plays such a big part of doing the civil rights for black people to be able to have an education because they couldn't go to, you know, like Mega Evans dealing with Ole Miss and things like that. They couldn't go to these universities and things like that, but they was able to go to these HBCUs, you know. So it, it's something deep to me and something important to me that these kids be okay, you know. And I think a lot of, I feel like if, you, if you're a black man and a black woman that is making money and, and doing well in life, you know, and you turn your back and don't help these HBCUs, you're a coward to me, you're weak to me. And I feel like, you know, I've accomplished a lot in my life, but I feel like this is something that I'm passionate about, you know, wanting to help these HBCUs so these students be okay. I, my daughter was at Grambling, and I saw the campus, how bad it was. You know, even though it's a it's an awesome institution and learning place, but, you know, these kids shouldn't struggle like that. They You know, their campus shouldn't look that way. You know what I mean? And the things that go on and, uh, you know what I mean? So it, it's real important to me, man. That's why I got involved with HBCUEroes.org to help them out, man. So and you understand. You Like you say, you went to Norfolk State. You know? Yeah. And I was on that I was on that campus, man, hoping somebody go get a two-piece from KFC, man. You know what I'm saying? I was man. on it, so I know. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, man. KFC's across the street from there. Yeah, yeah. man. I'm yep. 711 out of right. Brambleton. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah oh, man. I was hoping, putting together with your homie yeah. to get a two-piece from two piece or some nachos box. from 7-Eleven and a big go. Yeah. Look, the sweat box dances, you know, the student unions. And uh-huh. boy, 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 just after you come out, it's wintertime going into spring. Ain't nothing like them sparting that cuties out there. Boy, boy, boy. Yeah, Ooh. yes, indeed. CIAA tournament, man, all that, man. Yeah. Yes. You know what I'm saying? But, yeah. you know, that's what my passion that is was right great now. And, yeah, and, and yeah, that was you know, great with the COVID. That song represented. It, it represented yeah, that yeah. because we got that whole – Football halftime feel Like you know how it used to be back then When mm-hmm. you used to play the hype up You had the marching bands and Yeah that, and that's that, that's where it came there. from Who's and, and, You know and, and part of it is a song Where I'm saying I met my sister I met my brother Because you know that's one place Where you meet somebody and you become brother Or, or, or that's your sister for life You know what I'm saying and On HBCUs and, and I put in there you know, I gotta go, you know I got a degree You know what I'm saying But wherever I go you know, the HBCU, you can always be with me, you know, and even though I didn't get one, I didn't get to graduate from one, you know, but it was more or less like I felt like I wanted to make that song, that song for them, for HBCU, you know what I'm saying, that, that illustrated what they are, you know what I'm saying, all my life I wanted to go to HBCU, you know what I'm saying, and now I'm here, you know, you know and I could see a freshman three years from now, Singing that like that's something he has to has to recite, you know what I'm saying? I mean, and and you know, and and if you're an HBCU student in any form or fashion, wherever you go in life is always there for you, and it's always you know it's gonna always be with you. Like you look, look how passionate you sound talking about Norfolk State. It's gonna always be in you, and I don't think you get that yes, from is. other university. I don't think you get that from other universities. You know what I'm saying? You might remember your college days, but with HBCUs. It's, it's it's personal. It's family. You know what I'm it saying? Is. It's it's it's, it's it heritage. Is. It's it's everything. It is. Um, I mean, it's it's just something that uh, when you're looking at what education means for the value of it, and to have an outlet, mm-hmm. um, you know, uh, and you know when they, you know, even going to sports, um, and. Um, not to take shots at anybody, but when you're dealing with a lot of these big institutions, you know, the predominantly white institutions, a lot of times young brothers are looked at as just a number in terms of recruiting. And mm-hmm. a lot of times you see a lot of issues. You know, we're all we're all sports nerds. You played, me and King, we 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 watch mm-hmm. sports. So we've seen mm-hmm. we've seen stories of a lot of these transfers, a lot of these, you know, dudes come in. We don't know all the stories of what goes on in terms of what it's there doing mm-hmm. recruiting. But we know a lot of these, you know, a lot of these young boys don't get a chance to play, you know, because of whatever reason. But one thing about it with an HBCU, yeah. 
they're not going to jerk your chain. If you're if they, if no. they recruit you, you're going to play at one point or another. You're going to play. You and another and year. another thing too. Yeah. And another thing too, they're going to make you a student at HBCU. Like in in some yes, of those, you know, yes, I would are. say, you know, universities, the other universities, they'll find a way sometimes to let these guys pass through because they're great in in, in sports. But at HBCU, right. if they end up transferring there, yeah, you're going to play, but you're going to do your schoolwork. You know yes, what I'm saying? And, yes, and, and so, you know, I think the importance of HBCUs, and that's the one thing I want. I want HBCUs to become so important in black communities, especially lower income, where I want these kids to see, like, you know what? I can make it out by going to this HBCU. You know, colleges, I can go here. I can, you know... I can go, I can make it here. I, I know they'll accept me. And I always say that HBCU tend to accept what the other universities don't want if you're not an athlete. You feel what I'm saying? That's true. And, and, yeah. I, and, I, and I think, and like I said, man, the, the friendships that you make, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, like, you know, I, I, I have friends, I have friends that have, they meet when Southern and Grambling play the Bayou Classic, it's 10, 20 of them. You know, one one of my friends got about fifteen guys in, that he went to school with. You know what I'm saying? And it's like I envy that. Like, damn man, look how he got. You know what I'm saying? They they sharing these times. They meeting up every year. And then when it come down to business, he's like, oh, where you at now, sir? I'm like, oh man, I'm in Phoenix. Oh, uh, one of my guys, man, that I went that I went to school with, he owned this out here. They got a travel company. He got you. The, the connection in the in, yeah. in the in the deepness, you know, because every city we touched when we were on tour with No Limit, Moby, Moby, Moby Dick was, you know, he's a Q, you know, and he went to Southern. Mm-hmm. Every city Omega we touched, high. every city we touched, man, either some Omega owned a, a a bus service, a restaurant, or he was they was work, a manager or supervisor at a hotel. We always was okay. Cause all he did was let them know, hey, you know, team, I'm here, dog, I'm here. We need this, we need that, and they didn't shake. They were like, okay, got you. You know what I'm saying? My brother is Omega, and he graduated from Southern University in New Orleans. And no matter what, I could call him right now and say, hey, man, I, I need to get a job. He gonna tell me, hold up, let me call one of my my dogs, my team, team, team. My my people need this, they need that, they need, you know, where you wanna work at. And they open their arms to you. That's that's a camaraderie, man, that you don't get any just anywhere. And and a lot of times yeah. people got to remember too, who else is a Q doll? Michael Jordan is, and Shaq is. Yeah, and the Smith Shaq, is one yeah, too. I Shaq believe. Helped, Shaq helped out. Shaq helped out with our telethon. He he was a big supporter of it. You know what I'm saying? And even though Cedric Entertain, I think he's a capper. He was a big supporter mm-hmm. of it. You know what I mean? But we had a lot of football players that 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 helped us. You know what I'm saying? But but like I say, a lot of very important black people were part of fraternities. You know what I'm saying? Whether it's Kappa, whether it's whether it's Alpha, whether it's Zeta, whether it's AKA, whether it's Delta. You know what I'm saying? I mean, some of our most important. You know what? Martin Luther King was what an Alpha, if I'm if I'm correct. You know what I'm I saying? I think he was an Alpha Phi Alpha. Yeah. 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 You know, I mean, you know, and, and these are the things like, you know, you, you realize the the deepness of it and the respectability and the li- lifelong friendship and love for each other. You know, that's something because a lot of HBCU students, they're poor. So it's me and you on campus. You know, you know what I'm talking about. Hey, bro, I got $2, yeah, you got $2, we go get something to eat. You know what I'm saying? You, you know, you build something with them, you know, and you seeing the best of the best that look like you. That simple, yeah. man. So that's why I'm so deep into that cause, man. But, you know, other than that, man, I have a new EP out called COVID-19, talking about this epidemic, this pandemic or whatever you want to call what's going on that they're trying to do to us. You know, but I have that out right now, you know, produced by uh, ULP, D- uh, DJ Cube out of, out of Atlanta area. So, you know, that's my latest music and Got drip yeah, check plug out. Yeah, what you got going video. on? Yeah, man, I got sure. so much, man. Mm-hmm. Huh? Yo, I was just saying, yo, go ahead and unplug what you got going on. 
Oh, yeah, because I know we're time getting out, so I want to make sure, you know, of course, I got the HBCU for life, man. That's donated directly to HBCU, heroes.org, to help these kids. I got COVID-19, which is entirely produced by uh, – you. God, I think people are really going to love to hear this side of me, the way I'm rapping and what I'm doing, you know, talking about this pandemic and things like that. You know what I'm saying? Um, Michael Rappaport say where the rappers was at, so I'm here. You know, and I'm speaking upon it and, and things that's going on. Uh have Drip Chick, a song that's out that is that's steadily getting bigger and bigger, produced by Kid, Mad Money Group Entertainment, Wild Man Wide Open Management. You know, um we got we got so much, man. I got uh I'm about to re release life insurance, but I'm it's gonna be remastered, but it's gonna have a special audio edition where I'm telling you how every session happened. You know, it's going to be something special for people to hear. You know, we, of course, we were on tour before this pandemic happened. We was killing the tour scene. We ripped D.C. up, the, you know, one of the best shows, you know, in a long time. And we was lining up so many shows. But um, we definitely, you know what I'm saying, We once things, you know, hopefully get back to normal, you know, we got newer dates and things like that will be out there. And we're still pushing and fighting for C-Murder and Mac. You know, which is is very serious to us, man. You know, both of them wrongfully accused. You know, so we pushing with that. Silk has a new uh, documentary coming. I mean, we we're, we're constantly working, and for me, I'll, I'll be releasing a book called Letters to My Young Black Sons in July, um, which is oh, wow. a guide for young. Okay. Yes, yeah, it's, it's it's a guide like a, being a father figure for, you know, when b- young black men reach the age of thirteen. They they trying to figure out who they are, and a lot of them don't have father yeah. figures. So it's like a guide, like I'm saying, each thing is dear son. Okay, let me teach you about females and how to respect them. Never put your hands on them. Teaching them about their hygiene, you know, things that a father would tell his son. You know what I'm saying? I'm 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 giving a guide that some mothers that are by themselves they can give this child that book, and I'm teaching them everything you need to know. A lot about finances and. And getting the job and saving your money, getting a bank account, you know, taking and buying stocks and things like that. At 14, 15 years old, you you know, you can do these things because we're not taught finances in high school within the black community. Fuck PE. You know, put, do a finance class for our kids. You know, and so this book, you know, it just it's just about teaching, giving them a guideline, like I said, keeping themselves clean, how to deal with situations, you know, and, and, and just – all around just being a father for that child in a book form, you know, and a young black man that don't have one. That's something I'm real passionate about that's coming up. You know, uh, I have another EP called Legendary that's coming out, you know, different, you know what I mean, and and, and going to continue and do my best to help with the HBCUs, you know what I'm saying? But I would look forward to getting back on our tour with No Limit, you know, um, it's just a, it's a whole bunch of things, man. I go down the list that we got that that I got coming up. So people gonna hear a lot about me all year, and they're gonna see me all year. You know what I'm saying? And then my city, New Orleans, that you know we have some awesome artists that's rising out there. You know what I'm saying? That's doing their thing, man. And I'm I'm starting to to advise young artists and things like that. You know, get kind of stepping back from the microphone, even though I do a song a day, two songs a day still. You know what I'm saying? But in being a father, man, you know, trying to be a better father, and that's about, you know, a better son with my mom. So that's where everything at with me right now. Man, look, we we, we, we appreciate so much your time. We definitely got to have you back on again. You got the red carpet to come back anytime. You're free because there's so much that we didn't touch on that we, we got to touch oh, yeah. on, man. You know? got to do part two, man. You let's, know? let's do it. Whatever yeah, you yeah, ready, man. We, yeah. <laughs> Whenever you're yeah, ready to have a part yeah, two, right? Yeah, we're going to definitely set you know, that part two up, though. We're going to hit it with that return of Mr. Servon. Like, it's going to be like a trilogy yeah, going man. on. We got we got the Godfather series of interviews yeah. here. Yeah, let's do it, yeah. man. Let's do it, man. Because it's a lot. Yeah, it's, you know, it's a lot we didn't touch on. Some things that the world should know and that you guys, I know you want to act. So, man, you know, before I definitely leave, man, I want to tell you guys, thank you, man, and and young listeners out there, shows like this that you don't think, and nothing against The Breakfast Club. I love The Breakfast Club, but, you know, young artists, y'all thrive to be on The Breakfast Club first. But guys like this and shows like this, man, off the cuff, 
these are the guys that when nobody checking for you, they're going to be there for you and going to give you that chance. So don't ever think that, you know what I'm saying, understand the, 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 the respect and the passion that, that, that these guys do. It's not like they're getting paid millions of dollars to have us on here. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, please respect shows like this, and I thank you guys for definitely having me, man. We appreciate you coming on. No problem, man. Support. So, uh, that's, that's, the, that's the one thing we try to do with shows like this. You know, this is King Baby right here, you know, and this is the one thing we really enjoy because we're able to, we, 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 we're, we have that freedom to have these types of discussions and to really, really, really get a real story from, you know, real people such as yourself where there's no bubble mm-hmm. of Hollywood. It's just, it's just real the whole way. You know, and, uh, oh, we, definitely, man. Man, we, we, we thank you so much. We thank you. Uh, man, I, I appreciate it, man, and it's an honor. And, you know, like I said, man, let me know when y'all ready for round two, man. I'm, I'm, I'm you know, no matter what I'm doing, I'm definitely going to stop, man, and we're going to make it happen. Definitely, man. Um, yeah, man. But uh, once again, you know, you be blessed. Thank you so much for everything. You know, stay, you know, motivating. Stay, you know, inspiring. And most important, you know, um, thank you for you. Thank you for your presence being here because that is the present to us in this present time. And thank you so much. Man, I appreciate you guys, man. Y'all have a blessed day, man. Be safe out there, please. You too, man. You too, bro. Till next Keep time. in touch with you. All right, stay in touch with me, man. Anything you need, get at me. Peace. Yes, sir. Peace. All right, bro. We out of here. Yep.